Need one. What's up? Yes, I, I recorded the midterm review this morning, and so it's it's being processed by YouTube. So I'm going to post it right after the class. Yeah, yeah, I was a little bit late on it. I uh, yeah, I, I kind of got I was caught up with doing stuff yesterday, so I had to do it this morning. But it'll be up uh, in right after class today. All right, it's uh, one o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good. Doing good, doing good. Okay. Uh, today is an exciting day. Uh, well, maybe exciting, maybe not. But you know, if you're looking forward to ethics, this will be an exciting day because we're getting started with that. Okay. Um, so you know, you'll you'll see today that the class is going to take a, a pretty big shift, and so you know, instead of doing all these number calculations with uh, with economics and stuff. This is basically going to turn into a humanities class, and so you know we're going to, we're going to have a lot of story time. We're going to have a lot of like you know sharing. We're going to have a lot of you know talking about ethics and, and all that stuff. But uh, you know, it's interesting, and it's you know, and we'll talk about you know why we have this class the way that it is. Um, oh, sorry about that. Um, oh, can you uh, can you guys hear me on Zoom? Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe some are, uh, maybe check your volume, maybe. Hopefully, hopefully that's the issue. Um, anyway, yeah. So, so ethics is it's interesting because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be very different than, uh, um, um, than 
uh, what we've been covering so far. It makes a lot of sense, you know, after I kind of explain it, because it's it, when, when you first kind of hear that we're going to be doing economics and ethics in the same class, it's like, you know, that's so different from each other. But, you know, you'll see why we kind of put them in the same class. Um, in the day, okay? um, and so today we'll just introduce the idea. And so, uh, you know, we'll tell a couple of stories today and we'll introduce some kind of broader concepts in, uh, in engineering ethics. And over the next few weeks, uh, we'll kind of expand them. Okay? Um, one thing you can look forward to is next Tuesday, I'll, I'll introduce the final project. And so uh, if you guys remember from the syllabus, we don't have we don't have a final exam in this class. And so the midterm that you'll take on Thursday, that's the last exam we're gonna have. And then instead of a final exam, we have a final project. And so we'll talk about the details for that on next Tuesday, because it has more to do with ethics, uh, but I don't wanna talk about it before the exam, because I know everyone's gonna focus on that right now, okay? Speaking of the exam, uh, the exam is this Thursday in class. And so you guys know the drill by now. And so uh, it'll be the same as the first exam. Um, so the materials that you can bring is you can bring your cheat sheet. Remember that your cheat sheet is in a single eight and a half by 11 sheet of notes, front and back. You can write it, you can type it, you know, whatever you want. Uh, bring a writing utensil, pencil, paper, or pencil, a pen, you know, whatever you feel most comfortable with, and a calculator. You will you'll definitely need a calculator, okay? Um, and so I'll, I'll provide everything else. So I'll provide the exams, of course. Um, I'll provide the compound interest tables. Um, and then uh, for the tax problems, I'll provide the NACRS tables as well. And so you don't you don't have to write that in your cheat sheet. So um, if I do ask a problem on that on the exam, I'll, I'll provide that for you. Okay. And so for the cheat sheet, you can just focus on just example problems or concepts that you that you want. You don't have to copy down any data or anything because I'll, I'll provide all that for you. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's all my announcements. Um, there is a uh, we'll, we'll talk about that next week. So the, uh, there's going to be like an ethics writing assignment, homework assignment that we'll do next week. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it then. Okay. Question. Um, since the homework five is due today, are you going to post the solution? Yes. Yeah. So the solution for homework five will be, I'll do that kind of right before I go to bed today. And oh, the review video. So I I, um, I know I said I would do the review video yesterday, but I kind of got caught up on some, some other stuff, some kind of emergency stuff yesterday. So I couldn't get to it. But I did record it first thing this morning, and so I recorded it. It's on. It's actually on. It's uploading on YouTube right now, and then I'm, I'll post the link on Canvas, uh, basically right when you get back to the office. Okay. Um, and so you'll have that. You'll have that available for you. So both the solutions tonight and the review review video right after this. All right. Uh, any other questions before we uh, get started for today? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. So today uh, we'll just be introducing. Engineering ethics. Good. All right. All right. So, you know, if you think back to kind of the very early stages of the class, you know, what I what I said about this class is that it's all about decision making. Okay. So when you when you go into engineering, uh, when you get into professional practice, when you get into, uh, you know, out there in the real world, um, you have to make a lot of decisions about your work. And a lot of those decisions are technical in nature. And so you're gonna use you know, a lot of the knowledge that you've gained in your other classes to determine, you know, maybe how how thick this uh, this bridge should be, or how many, or how much cement do we need, or how much material do we need, right? So there's a lot of technical decisions that you have to make, but there's a lot of, I would say other decisions that you have to make as well. And part of that is economics, right? And so you have to make kind of the best economic decisions for your company just to make sure that your projects are profitable and you kind of make the company the most money as possible. Um, but there's a lot of other decisions you have to make as well. And you know, we kind of we kind of group all of those decisions, you know, kind of underneath ethics. Okay. okay. And so first let me start off by saying that you know it's it's important for engineers to you know produce good products that are both good technologically and good economically, but they have to kind of be aware of ethics at the same time.
And so, you know, before, um, you know, both in your other classes and earlier in this class, we focused on kind of the first two points there. So technologically impressive, technologically sound, um, you know, it has to make sense and it has to work real well. It has to be profitable. The company has to be able to support this. Uh, but if not profitable, you know, it has to, you know, be at least efficient, right? Uh, but the last part is, is ethical. Okay? And the reason for this is, is very simple, actually, because, you know, a lot of the projects that engineers work on, a lot of the products that they make, a lot of the kind of the installations that they do are going to be used by people. And you want to make sure that the people that are using your products or you are interacting with your work are going to be safe. You know, they're going to be, um, you know, not harmed in any way, both, you know, physical or, or mental. And so if you think about a lot of the products that you that you use in your in your daily life, so think of like, you know, maybe your phone, maybe your um, computer, your laptop, your car, um, you know, the elevators and the buildings, the building itself, right? And so when you interact with these um, objects, or maybe, you know, you just walk into these, these things, there's kind of an expectation that you're going to walk out of it, you know, with, with most of your limbs still there, you know, without, you know, losing an eye or anything like that. Um, and you expect them to work. And so that's 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 part of what engineering ethics is, is to kind of make sure that you're aware of kind of the people that are using your uh, your projects and you know make sure that they they come out of it well. Okay. All right. And so in theory, it sounds easy, right? And so um, you know, it, it's it's you know, basically you can boil ethics down to just, you know, just don't be a bad person, right? And that's something that I think a lot of people they just you just kind of do on a daily basis. And so you know, I, you know, so I believe that, you know, most, you know, that the vast majority of people in this earth are good people and that they don't go out of their way to harm other people, right? And so if you just kind of be as you are, then you kind of um, will kind of avoid all these ethical issues. But it's not, and unfortunately, it's, it's not as simple as that because when you, when you kind of factor in all the different kind of uh, competing factors that go into an engineering project, you know, ethics and being ethical is maybe something that gets gets sacrificed in order for other things like profitability like maybe uh, or like a new technology and things like that okay. And so, you know, the way I'm going to approach this, this section here is, is, you know, quite different. And so I'm not, I'm not going to claim that I know I have all the answers to, to everything because, you know, just by its very nature, ethical concerns and ethical, ethical situations are a lot more complex and there's no like equation or there's no procedure that you can follow to give you the right answer every time. Okay. Especially not with the time that we have left. So we're in week 11 right now. We have the midterm exam next, uh, you know, this upcoming Thursday. And so we don't really have a full semester to really dive into a lot of these situations. And so kind of the approach that I'm going to have here is I'm going to tell you basically a lot of stories. And so um, kind of the, the interesting thing about ethics is that there's been a lot of ethical situations that have, that have come up over the years. And a lot of these stories are very, very compelling. And so they make for you know, excellent story time and they make for excellent learning opportunities as well. And that's not to say that, you know, you won't run into situations, you're probably not going to run into exactly the same situations as these, as kind of the, some of the stories that we'll tell. Part of that is because, you know, technology has advanced quite a bit from some of these stories. But what I'm hoping for is that, you know, you can take it some of the lessons that, you know, maybe some of what the engineer should have done in those situations and then apply that to your own professional practice. Okay. 
Okay. Right. So it'll be, it'll be a lot of story time. And then, uh, you know, for your projects too, you'll see next week that, you know, you're going to be researching a particular case study and telling that story in class as, as well. Okay. All right. Any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right. So speaking of story time, let's start with, I think, probably the most famous engineering ethics case. And so, you know, you take, you take an engineering ethics course um, anywhere in the U.S., and this, this case always gets brought up. Maybe you're familiar with it already, and that's the uh, the Ford Pinto. Okay. All right. So the Ford Pinto is a is a car, and so it was developed by Ford Motors. Um, you know, and Ford is still around today, and so you you probably have heard of them. And this happened in the 1970s. Okay. So this was quite a while ago, so over 50 years ago. Okay. And so in the 1970s, um, you know, Ford produced this car as part of this kind of like a subcompact craze. And so it was a, a lot of other car manufacturers, both in the U.S. and abroad, were producing these kind of smaller cars that were becoming very, very popular in the market. And so um, uh, basically that was during a time when, you know, uh, families were looking to you know, buy a car that was very economically efficient, that could transport their family and you know, be very cheap both, you know, initially and then also on the gas prices, okay? And so the, my best drawing of the car, and I say every year that I'm going to produce slides for this, but I always just end up being too busy. And so you're going to have to make do with my crappy drawing. So the Ford Pinto looks something like this, okay? okay. Use, use your imagination. So. <laughs> You probably look up a better image on your phone, um, you know, than this. Okay, um, and so you know, if if this car didn't have all the ethical concerns for it, it would be kind of just a footnote in history. Yeah? It'd be something that maybe the Ford phases out eventually, just because you know the trends change. But you know, everyone, you know, anyone who really studies engineering kind of knows the story of the Ford Pinto, but it's kind of for all the wrong reasons. Okay. And so the most famous incident that happened with the Ford Pinto was on August 10th, 1978. And so what happened on this date was that uh, a family um, was driving their Ford Pinto uh, on the freeway, and then someone hit their car from behind. And so what happened, what happened then, and, and the Ford Pinto was, was kind of already known for this at the time. So this, this wasn't exactly a new thing, but the impact caused the gas tank to rupture and it caused the, the entire car to kind of erupt in flames. And the reason why this, the reason why this incident in particular, the August tenth incident, became so famous was that this was the first one that actually resulted in casualties. So, and so the the entire uh, everyone inside the car, um, you know, didn't make it unfortunately. And so they all they all passed away. Okay. And so the re the reason for the explosion. So, um, you know, you've you've probably seen cars get rear-ended before, and so it usually doesn't end up with a with an explosion. But the Ford Pinto was getting known for this because because of the way the car was designed. Okay. And so the the way the car was designed was that it had the gas tank in a very uh, in a very kind of um, vulnerable position. Okay, and so it was in a position such that if the car was struck from behind. Then it gave a very large likelihood that the gas tank would rupture, resulting in you know big flames coming from the car.
And so you might be asking, you know, why, why would you ever design a car like that? So why would you, why would Ford kind of intentionally kind of design a car such that the gas tank was in such a vulnerable position? Because uh, this is not, this is not like this is Ford's first ever car. And so they, they knew how to design cars, uh, but it was only this one that, that had this issue of, uh, of, of exploding. Uh, and the reason for that was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't something that was, you know, um, intentional by any means. And so Ford, you know, didn't, didn't try to, to hurt people by, by designing this car, but it was a sacrifice that the designers had to make in order for them to meet deadlines, in order for them to meet cost, um, you know, uh, the cost of the car. And so remember, you know, this came out in a time where, you know, this, the market for this particular car was extremely competitive. And so, um, you know, in order for Ford to give it, to sell an attractive product, you know, one that carries their name, but also is at a good cost for, 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 uh, for families to buy, they had to make a lot of shortcuts along the way. And part of that was, you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, the, uh, I'm putting that gas tank in that unfortunate position you know, without, uh, without much protection. Okay. And this is, you know, and this is just kind of one case right here, you know, and, and you know, and there's, and there's a lot, a lot more to this case. Um, this is actually one of the topics for the final project. So I'm not going to dive too much into it, but, you know, I bring this up as kind of the first example, because this is, this is kind of the reason why, you know, we have both economics and ethics together in the same class, because you can see a lot of times these two factors are at odds with each other within an engineering project. Because from the Ford company point of view, you know, they had, they had to get the car out there, um, you know, because they, they wanted to start making money on it. And then, you know, and they had to set the price at a certain price point because their, based their economic analysis said that, you know, if we don't sell the car at this price, then we're not going to sell enough to justify the production, justify all the design time. But then on the other side, you have the engineers that are saying that, you know, we need more time to develop this car. We need more resources. We need to buy, you know, more material, stronger material so that, something like this doesn't happen. Okay. So this, so this is this is a very classic kind of situation. And not and not all ethical situations are like are like this, but this is kind of a more a more common. Okay. And so we teach you kind of the economics at the beginning of this class. So just to let you know that you know there is a very strong economic side that goes to engineering projects. But then you know we also remind you that there's also the ethical side that we need to have in mind too. Okay. Um, and so, you know, if you wanted to know the conclusion for this, you know, Ford was sued uh, in a criminal lawsuit, actually, uh, because, you know, they were, they couldn't hide the fact that they were actually aware of all these safety concerns, but they still pushed the car out there. Um, and so, you know, they, they knew that the car didn't meet, you know, rigid, rigorous engineering standards, even though technically, technically speaking, the car met federal standard, fed, federal safety standards, but not the engineering ones. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a very interesting case that, you know, if, if you do um, decide to do it, or you have a group that wants to do this for the final project, you'll, you'll learn a lot about this. So yeah, Ford Pinto, very interesting, very famous, but I think also there's a lot of really uh, interesting kind of facets to the story as, as well. Okay. All right. Any questions on, on this? Okay. All right. So, you know, that's, that's just kind of one example story and so you know, we'll be hearing a lot of these stories you know throughout the class of, of situations like this and there's there's a lot and there's there's even actually been a lot in recent news too um 
And so if you're familiar with the Boeing 737 MAX, that's something that's fairly recent too. That is a textbook, you know, engineering ethics case study as well. And so that's that's a very interesting one, uh, very interesting one for the final project. Okay. All right, but let's dive a bit deeper into uh, what engineering ethics is. <laughs> Okay. All right. So the Ford Pinto, uh, you know, obviously it was is a matter of public safety, and public safety, I think, is probably the number one um, aspect of engineering ethics. That's always going to be number one, and uh, you know, and it's 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 so important that you know every company that tries to sell you something will tell you that safety is so important to them. Safety is number one, but you know, uh, but they that's I mean nowadays it's more of a marketing thing more than more than an engineering thing, but there's uh, there's a lot more aspects to engineering ethics as well, and so some and so some um, factors that you know we'll go over some of these in a lot of stories will be like bribery. Fraud, uh, environmental protection, which is uh, you know becoming much much more uh, uh, it's, it's getting much more of the limelight nowadays. Um, there's are there's honesty in research and development. Uh, computer privacy, also kind of fairly new, fairly new topic that's that's kind of evolving every day. And conflicts of interest. And so these are some of the other kind of um, aspects of engineering ethics, which, you know, is a lot is a lot to cover. And like I like I mentioned that, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna be able to cover each one of these in in detail. But a lot of the stories that we'll that we'll talk about in this class will have some aspect of these, um, you know, to a greater degree or a lesser degree. But you know, ethics kind of dives you know deep into a lot of a lot of these things. Okay. All right. So let's let's define what ethics actually means. So if you look up ethics in the dictionary, um, you'll actually find something that doesn't have to do with engineering at all. And so and ethics kind of span a lot uh, a lot more than just engineering. And so the exact definition is the study of the characteristics of morals okay. It's the study of the characteristics of morals and also the moral choices that are made by individuals. So that's the um, that's the flat definition of ethics. And so when we talk about engineering ethics, we talk about basically ethics applied to engineering practice. All right, and just like I mentioned before, and, and probably you've guessed already too, that ethics is, is not, it's not really like a, 
it's not a science type of, of subject. It's very much like a hum art or humanities type of, of subject. And so there's no formulas, there's no, you know, low charts, there's no numbers really to really to really tell us, you know, what's the right thing to do. Um, but and there's no that means there's no definitive answers as well. And so, you know, almost everything that we're going to look at in, in engineering ethics is up to interpretation to a certain degree. OK. Um, and so, you know, kind of with the time that we have remaining, you know, I'm going to, you know, like I said, we're going to be sharing a lot of stories. We're going to be talking about a lot of case studies to just kind of make you aware of some of the situations that you um, that you could be faced with in your professional work. And, you know, what are some what are some kind of um, viable actions that you can take? Because I think, you know, when it's, 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 it's one thing to kind of hear about um, the situations that people get into. It's one thing to hear about the case studies. And it's very easy to say, like, oh, you know, if, if I was the Ford engineers, I wouldn't let this design go through. I would, I would stop it right there. Right? It's very different kind of when you're in that situation and your manager is kind of telling you one thing. So your manager is saying, you know, approve this design. You know, we need to get this through. But, you know, your ethics and your morals might be telling you something else. And so in those situations, it can be hard to really know what your options are in terms of, you know, what you what you should do and what you what you can even do. And so, um, you know, we're going to focus a lot on the case studies, but also, you know, we're going to talk about, you know, what could be done realistically in those situations. So, you know, what options are available to you if you, if you do have to make those those choices. OK. All right. And kind of the important thing to keep in mind is that, you know, whenever, you know, when we're hearing about all these case studies and when we're learning about all these different um, ethical theories is that context is going to be very important. Okay? And so, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time, you know, thinking about, you know, if we were in that situation, this is kind of what we're thinking about economically. This is what we're thinking about from a technological point of view. You know, these are the people involved. And so, you know, knowing the entire picture is going to be really important to really understanding um, these situations. Okay? Right, so it's it's important to remember all that context, and it's also important to remember that you know, as, as a professional engineer, you'll be working with a lot of uncertainty too. And so, um, you know, you may design a product in a certain way, and you try to make it as safe as possible, but that doesn't eliminate the possibility that someone can hurt himself you know, with their um, with your product. I, I, for some reason, this this always stood out to me. But when I was in elementary school, um, you know, I think one of my friends um, had this um, enlightenment that you know almost anything can be used as the weather, and he shared this with us. And so he was like, you know, I don't understand why they don't allow you know certain things in school when anything can be used as a weapon. This chair can be used as a weapon. You know, I can just stuff it down your throat. This pencil can be used as a weapon. I can stuff it down your throat. My lunchbox can be used as a weapon. I can just bash you in the head with it. I was like, dude, Connor, I'm trying to eat my lunch, man. It's like, why are you, why are you telling me this? Um, and so, you know, even, you know, if, well, the, the point I'm trying to make is that even if you design something benign like a lunchbox, 
it still can be used as a weapon. <laughs> and, and so people will find a way to hurt themselves with your work, you know, some way or another. And so, you know, there's no way to kind of eliminate that possibility. And so there's always going to be some uncertainty. And, you know, if you want to make something that's successful, you know, the kind of the bottom line is you need to take some degree of risk as well. And so it's it's impossible to eliminate all the risk involved in uh, in any kind of uh, work that you do, engineering or otherwise, right? Um, and so it's impossible to eliminate it. Though so, you know we do have to kind of we do have to make the effort as engineers to try to minimize that risk as much as possible. Okay. Okay. So we'll dive a lot more into that starting next week. And so next week, you know, we'll we'll talk about public safety and you know, which which may seem like a fairly straightforward thing, but there's it's 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 tough because you know you want to make something that's going to be successful and that's going to be profitable, but you know, there's there's going to be some risk associated with that. And so how do you balance that risk? You know, what are the, some of the things that you think about? It's it's it gets it gets a bit complicated. Okay. All right, any questions on on this so far? Okay. All right. So next, let's talk about uh, professional codes of ethics. And so, engineering uh, in general, um, you know, whether you're a mechanical engineer, civil engineer, uh, computer engineer, you know, it's considered a profession. And one of the um, kind of one of the requirements for being considered a profession is that you have professional societies and professional standards. Okay, and so for engineering, that takes the form of professional codes of ethics. And so if you're part of a, of a professional society uh, right now, you more than likely they have some kind of codes of ethics. And so some examples of these would be IEEE, um, um, you know, a, um, AIAA, ASME, you know, all of these, um, you know, societies that have an acronym because the names are too long, you know, they have, they, they're more than likely have a code of ethics. Okay? And, uh, you know, the purpose of these codes of ethics is to basically provide a framework for making ethical judgments as a uh, as a professional engineer.
All right. So, you know, I think, you know, most of the times when I, when, when you hear about a code of ethics or something like that, you know, you may think of something similar to like the 10 commandments. And so, you know, there, there are decrees that, you know, you have to kind of follow in order to live an, an ethical life. Okay. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's not going to be that simple, right? So remember, right? Like I said before, ethical situations are so complex that, you know, there's not going to be one code of ethics or kind of one answer to every situation. Okay. Um, and so a code of ethics is not, is not like a magic punch. It's not going to tell you, you know, what to do in every situation. Um, but what you should view them as is kind of something that you can interpret um, to kind of give you some, some guidance in, in those situations. Okay. And, the, you know, the purpose of these ethics is, is actually, this, these codes of ethics is not to, you know, give you more rules to live by. And so I think when people first hear about this, like, oh, you know, I got to, you know, there's more rules for me to, to do. And so, uh, you know, more requirements. And so, you know, that's, it seems like a hassle, but these professional societies, you know, they don't write these codes of ethics to give you more, more things to burden you with. They're actually there to kind of help you. Um, and I know that's the, that's the PR, you know, BS that every rule, every person that wrote a rule ever said is that, you know, these rules are here to protect you, they're there to help you. But, you know, this one is, is a little bit different because what you can do is you can use these codes of ethics to kind of give you support or to kind of give you, um, you know, backup, um, backup, you know, if you are in a situation where your company is asking you to do something that you may not feel comfortable with or that you may find is unethical, you can say that, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a professional engineer, I have my own code of ethics. And so because this violates my codes of ethics, then I can't carry out what you're asking me to do. And so it's almost like you have the backing of, of the entire professional society. And so let's say that your company is asking you to do something that you don't find good. And you could say that, you know, I'm part of IEEE, you know, I don't feel comfortable with this. And it says so here in the code of conduct or the code of ethics for IEEE that, you know, I shouldn't be doing this. And so, you know, it, it's not, it's not usually in good, uh, it's usually not a good idea for your company to, I mean, if they piss off you, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. You're just one person. But if they, if they piss off the entire IEEE, you know, then IEEE might say, you know, this company is, is making our engineers do something that's not favorable. And so then, you know, they can, they can take some, some further action, either a lawsuit, or they can just tell their members not to work for this company. And so it, it, it provides you a much stronger back. And that's, and that's kind of what the code of ethics is, is to um, kind of give you that kind of support that, you know, say that this is, this is what IEEE thinks an ethical engineer should do. And that if you're asked to not do that, then, you know, you incur the wrath of IEEE. But it's, it's not something where, like, if you break these codes of ethics, you know, the IEEE is not going to send a hitman after you and then say that this person broke the IEEE code of ethics, and so we're going to assassinate him or something like that. It's, it's nothing like that. It's, it, is, it is really meant to help. Okay. Right. And so, you know, there's, there's lots of different codes of ethics out there. You know, like I said, most professional societies um, have their own. But for this class, you know, we're going to focus on two um, two specific ones because I think they give kind of a good they give a good spectrum in terms of what you can generally expect. Okay. okay. 
And so the first code of ethics is the IEEE. Speaking of IEEE. Right, so I, I like the IEEE one, and that's and that's generally the one that I, I refer to a lot just because they're they're a lot shorter than, than most codes of ethics. And so they don't take like they don't take like a good half an hour to read through. Um, but they kind of give a good broad, they, they kind of cover almost everything that you would expect in a code of ethics. Okay. And so IEEE generally is shorter and easier to understand. Um, but because it's shorter, it's, it's, it's also a lot more general than some of the other ones. And so they're not going to give you, you know, specific situations. And so a lot of it is more open to interpretation. Uh, so the IEEE one is, is the one that I, I generally use. It's, it's the one I, uh, uh, I refer to a lot. Um, but there's also the NSPE one. And so NSPE stands for the National Society of Professional Engineers. Okay, and so they they put out their own standards. Um, and so the NSPE ones are a lot longer. They're a lot more detailed. Um, you know, but they but they give you kind of, they're more they're more concrete in kind of what you what it tells you what it tells you what's ethical and what's not. Okay. And so I'm, I'm going to post both of these on on uh, on Canvas, and so um, I'm going to I'm, I have a PDF for both of these um, codes of ethics, and I'll post it there just so that you can refer to them, you know, as we're doing, um, as we're going through our you know story time and everything, and as you do your projects, so that you can kind of refer to these, these codes of ethics. Okay, so codes of ethics are great because you know they they are they're written specifically by engineers for engineers, and so you know you'll find it a lot more relevant to the work that you're doing. Um, and, and so it's kind of like your first stop shop into you know, seeing, is this what I'm doing is ethical or, or not? And it's, you know, you'll, you'll know that you have the backing of the professional societies uh, behind you. So yeah, the professional codes are, are definitely great tools and, and just good and just good to be aware of just in general um, as you, you know, as you graduate and you enter the, the professional world. Okay. All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right, so that's the professional code. So, I, like I said, that's probably your first uh, your first stop uh, in terms of you know um, determining what is uh, ethical or not. Uh, but there's also broader theories as well that are that go beyond just engineering. Um, and so we'll call this uh, ethical and moral theories. And so besides the uh, besides the the uh, engineering code of ethics, um, you know, there's other theories that you can use to drive your decisions as well. Um, and so these are kind of good just to be aware of. And so, of course, there's there's way there's way more than I can list here, but I'm going to list just kind of the few that are kind of most relevant to engineering work, um, you know, just because uh, you know, there's there's too many there's otherwise there's too many to go. And so what these are, these are kind of more general um, ethical theories that are that kind of govern just kind of general general decision making. Okay. 
And I will say that none of these theories are particularly right or wrong. And so, of course, you know, it's all up to interpretation. Um, but what they can, well, what they can do is they can help serve as additional guidance. So if you, if you have a situation that you're that you're facing at work, and the engineering codes of ethics, you know, may not cover this, or you know, you may have you may have conflicting information between between different codes. You know, you can bring in some of these general um, ethical theories to kind of help you make a decision that you feel comfortable with. Okay. All right, so the first one is called utilitarianism. Okay. And so utilitarianism is a moral theory uh, that strives to maximize the well-being of society as a whole. Okay. So it sounds great, right? And so, you know, that's, that sounds like something we should be maximizing. Um, so we should be maximizing the society. Uh, but this often comes at the cost of, um, of, uh, of the well-being of, uh, of an individual or maybe certain groups of individuals. Right? Okay. All right. So when, when you look at it, kind of, when you look at it from like you know ten miles away, you know that seems great. And so you know, this, the way the way I think a lot of people interpret this is say is to say that you know maybe a few people have to sacrifice, but then a lot of people get to benefit. Right? And so it's like, yeah, you know, we should we should do that. But you know, it's it's not it doesn't always lead to a fair or equitable um, solution. Okay. So let me give you an example. And so. And this is kind of more engineering and flavor, okay? And so let's consider the construction of a dam. Okay. All right, so dams are generally seen as, as a good thing. So they provide a lot of benefits to the surrounding, um, the surrounding community. And so these would be things like flood control, drinking water. Uh, oftentimes these have some, some generators because they, they use the moving water, okay? And so these are, gen dams are generally seen as, as a good thing. I know we don't really worry about flooding here in California because you know, we get rain like three times a year. But you know, if you're in an area that has uh, that can be susceptible to those things, you'd be like, you know, hell yeah, you know, prevent my house from getting flooded. That's uh, that's a great thing. Okay? But oftentimes, you know, whenever you construct uh, a big something big like this, like like a dam that's going to cover a wide area, a lot of the people that kind of live in the surrounding area often have to relocate 
or they may have to kind of permanently change their the way of life. And actually, you know, I have a couple of friends that work for, for Caltrans and, you know, they've, they've told me stories about, you know, Caltrans, they want to build a freeway or they want to build a road through this area. And then, you know, if you have a house there, too bad, you're going to have to move. <laughs> so, you know, um, when, like, which again, you know, you think about it from like 10 miles away, it's like, oh, it's just a few people, you know, they're going to have to get a new house and stuff like that. Um, you know, they may or may not be compensated from the city, but, you know, if you think about it, like if that ha if that had to happen to you, and so like let's say that you know you've you've lived in a certain place, you've lived there for 10, 15 years, then all of a sudden, you know, the city decides that they want to build a dam over your area and you have to move. Right? And so of course there's the practical difficulties with finding a new place to live, but then there's also the sentimental values as well. And so you know, it's, it's not it's not always an easy kind of uh, job. Um, I can think of a more extreme example. So you know, this is this is more sci-fi. So let's say that our earth here was invaded by an alien species and they say well, they will blow up the entire earth unless you sacrifice exactly 33 people to us. And what if Cal State Fortune as, as a whole decided that our section of EGME 401, we're gonna be the ones to be sacrificed in the alien race. And so, you know, yeah, it's great. You know, we saved the entire earth, but it's like, you know, why did they pick us? And so, you know, there's, there's not always a, there's with utilitarianism, there's not always a fair and equitable solution to a lot of problems, even though on paper, a lot of them seem very, very, very great. And so, you know, a lot of these moral theories, you know, they may, they, they, they make themselves kind of sound good, but, you know, when you kind of put them to some search situations, they may not give you the perfect solution, but again, you know, these, the, the idea is not to make a perfect solution with these, but they're just different ways that you can think of, different perspectives that you can take, um, you know, that will, you know, that will help you you know, make an ethical decision, okay? All right, any questions on utilitarianism? Okay. All right, and so another another um, moral theory that's used is uh, duty ethics and right uh, rights ethics. And so these are um, kind of the same thing. And you know, some some may say kind of run counter to what utilitarianism is, uh, um, what what they what they're proposing. Okay, and so under duty rights ethics, they basically say that as a society, we have the duty to protect the individual rights of, of everyone that's part of the society. Okay. And by rights, we mean things like the right to life, liberty, property, and you know, um, you know everything that 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 gives us. Okay, and it's all of our collective responsibilities to protect that from um, from others. Okay? And so going back to the dam example, you know, um, those people that live near where the construction is going to be, 
you know, that may say like, hey, you know, that that violates my rights because, you know, I've, I've lived here for you know 20 years of my life. And then now you're going to put this you know, big dam here and have to relocate and everything like that. Okay, so it's uh, it's complicated. And, you know, there's uh, if, if you're kind of familiar with kind of uh, um, a lot of the the housing problems that we have in California, a lot of those uh, initiatives are kind of blocked by by these uh, by duties and rights ethics. And so there's a group of people um, called NIMBYs. And so NIMBY stands for not in my backyard, uh, which oppose a lot of uh, you know buildings of, uh, of new housing of apartments of, of high density housing because you know it would um you know it would it would kind of change the feel of the of their entire uh of their entire community because you have a lot more cars going around it's going to generally be a lot less safe it's going to be more crowded and so you know and so balancing those two balancing you know how do we make things that are how do we, how do we make things that are kind of good for society while kind of protecting the rights of, of everyone there it's delicate and it's complicated and, and there's there's not a lot of easy solutions out there at all So I, I always say that, you know, it's utilitarianism always sounds great until you're the one that's going to ask the sacrifice. And so, um, you know, what may what may not sound important to other people may be something that's very important to, to you. And so, um, it's 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 tough and it's and it's complicated. And, and, you know, that's why that's why for ethics, you know, there's not one answer. And you know, I think some people feel very strongly about, uh, you know, certain things or, or other people. But, you know, the important thing always is to be kind of respectful. And uh, kind of try to understand kind of where everyone's coming from and the full context of, it, of what's going on. Okay. All right. Um, any questions on on this? Okay. All right. Number three um, is something called virtue ethics. So the virtue ethics is a little bit more. Um, I call it frou frou, and so it's not. Uh, um, you know, I, I I wouldn't say that this is used seriously by, by a lot of people but I think I think it's kind of um it's kind of the I, I would say the implicit way that a lot of people try to make or justify their own ethical decisions okay so virtue ethics kind of uh kind of centers around what uh what a virtuous person would do or kind of a fictitious virtuous person would do okay And so, you know, the reason I, I call this kind of frou frou is because it, it gets a little bit personal because then uh, there are a lot of, I would say, kind of personal characteristics that people would generally consider to be virtues. And so things like responsibility, honesty, competence, loyalty, respect. And so, you know, they, we think of decision making in terms of those things. And, you know, when we, when we, when we use those to kind of guide our ethical decision making, we call that virtue ethics. Okay. And of course, the opposite of these would be things that are we consider vices. And so things like dishonesty, um, you know, uh, incompetence, irresponsibility, disrespect. And so, you know, virtue ethics, um, you know, it's, it's not, I would say, different from the other um, cases, but, you know, they focus on these kind of personal characteristics. And so that kind of makes things get a bit more, a bit more personal. Okay. And so the reason I would say that this this isn't as useful for engineering decisions because you know these these are often traits we give to people. Okay? And so they're not often 
it's hard to kind of characterize decisions or actions uh, according to these um, kind of characteristics. But it can still be useful, and so it can it can you know it can still uh, you know be useful if uh, as just kind of another thing that you can uh, um, uh, another another framework that you can use for for making decisions. Okay, okay. and so I'm going to end today with kind of one final story. So I think this one's probably a, a little bit lesser known than the Ford Pinto, uh, but I think it kind of also encapsulates a lot of uh, a lot of what we've just been talking about. All right, and so uh, this story takes place in 1984. And uh, we're gonna be going to a town called Bhopal in India. All right, and so a little bit of context, you know, before we talk about the uh, um, kind of the tragedy is that um, in kind of the, in the seventies, there was a chemical plant that was built in Bhopal, India uh, that was providing a lot of benefits to the surrounding area. Okay. And so that chemical plant was providing things like jobs for a lot of the, for a lot of the community there. And so a lot of people in that town basically work at the plant. Uh, it provided a lot of economic stability. And so it brought in a lot of money, which was able to kind of improve the infrastructure, improve the, uh, uh, improve a lot of things in that town. Okay. Uh, but unfortunately, in 1984, what happened was a pressure relief valve um, on a tank um, ruptured. And so that caused uh, toxic chemicals to, to kind of spew out to the uh, surrounding town. Let's see, pressure relief valve. Okay. And unfortunately, you know, they, they couldn't get it under control before a lot of people were exposed to this chemical. And so it was, it was actually ended up being quite tragic. And so um, over 2,000 people were killed, and then thousands more were, uh, were injured or, or permanently disabled. Um, so, you know, it was, it was, it was quite the tragedy. And so after, after the tragedy, you know, they, they did some investigation in, in terms of, you know, what caused this um, and how can it be, how it can be, um, you know, prevented in the future. And what they found was that the, the, the pressure relief valve that broke 
um, it wasn't just a, a random valve. So that valve, was, that the reason that valve was in such a bad shape was because there was um, a lot of negligence in terms of the safety protocol and the, uh, in the plant. Okay. And so it was a situation where, you know, the plant should have serviced that, uh, that pressure relief valve. They should have replaced it or they should have maintained it better. Um, you know, and, be and because of that negligence, it ruptured. And of course, you know, it caused the, the tragedy that uh, that's there. Okay. Um, and so, you know, this is a, a cautionary tale because, you know, it's on the one hand, you know, this, this plant was providing a lot of benefits for the surrounding area. And so in terms of utilitarianism, you know, it was providing a lot of jobs, it was providing a lot of revenue, that those jobs were bringing in a lot of money to the city that was, you know, improving kind of the lives of everyone around them, you know, but it was at kind of a, a tragic cost, unfortunately. And so, you know, this has to be balanced with, you know, safety, with costs, and, you know, with everything to make sure everything is still up to, up to code. Okay. All right, any questions on, on this? All right, one final thought, um, and, you know, I, I, I have a bit more to say on this, but, you know, there's, there's kind of so much to say that I think it's, it's, it's kind of good to leave it at this, that nowadays, you know, the kind of the engineering world and just the world in general is becoming a lot more global. And so when you're doing professional work um, as an engineer, you know, it's much more likely you're going to collaborate with, um, you know, companies in different countries or even different states you know, or different uh, um, places with different cultures. And so it's important to, to recognize that, you know, what culturally, you know, what you consider to be ethical or what's important to you, you know, may be different than, you know, maybe another country and what they're kind of used to doing in terms of their ethics. And so, you know, how you navigate, you know, how you navigate that kind of space to kind of make sure that your partnership is, is a profitable one, but still kind of respecting everyone's ethics and respecting everyone's, uh, um, you know, morals is difficult and I think that's becoming an increasingly valuable skill nowadays as to how to work with um, you know international international teams okay. all right and so that's uh, that's all I had planned for today um, and so you know today we just provided just a, an introduction to ethics and then over the next couple of weeks and then after Thanksgiving of course you know we'll be diving uh, more into it okay all right, so that's it for today. So remember, Thursday is the midterm exam. Uh, so remember to come here for that. There's uh, there's no plans to offer virtually, and so make sure you're present here. Um, if you have any questions on the homeworks or anything, uh, I have office hours tomorrow. I have office hours Thursday morning. Uh, if not, you can email me. You know, I, I try to get back to you as soon as I can with with emails, usually within an hour or two. Um, and so you can email me then. And so yeah, and so have a great day, everyone, and I'll see you all on Thursday. Yeah, it's not like a homework question. It's kind of more of like a, a theoretical question a little okay. bit. So the little workshop we did kind of got me thinking yesterday. And I was talking to my girlfriend and she like, I wonder like if there's like, or I guess she's seen that there's um like a device that like, when you, you move a lid and then the rice pours out into like oh. a, into a cup and yeah. then just you turn it when it's closed. Yep. But I thought it'd be a good idea to like, okay, what if I want to like have like some type of like weight or like um like scale and then once everything like a center on the scale, it'll stop like filling. Uh -huh. But I was I was thinking about it earlier today. And if it's pouring, will it count the correct amount or is it gonna count like part of what's in the bag as well? If like there's like a bag pouring on top, yeah, and is it gonna read it properly? You can you can calibrate uh, scales to do it do properly, and that's that's how a lot of like like if you go to like a factory that's like that's bagging all these like big bags of rice, that's how mm -hmm. they do it. And so yeah. they, they factor in kind of the weight of the bag that's already there, okay. and then they, and they keep pouring until the weight is like fifteen pounds or something like that. And that's
and then they should kind of ship it off. From, you know. Okay. Yeah, there's there's definitely ways to calibrate that, and there's there's a lot of you know probably like a simple scale like that. You know, it would be harder to calibrate on it, but mm -hmm. there's there's definitely more sophisticated scaling which can which can adjust for those things. Okay. I got a 3D printer also, so I could I could also make like something like more manual, like how she's talking about. Yeah. But I feel like it'd be more fun to try to do something like that. Mm. Yeah, no, I think it'd be, yeah, I think it'd be cool. I think normally you see those things in kind of industrial settings, but I think there's not that many things like that for like home use or um or smaller, smaller use. So yeah, yeah I wanted cool. to be like, okay, she wants like hundred grams of rice, uh -huh. like hundred grams, and then there's like dispense it ah uh, okay oh i see i see what you mean yeah that would be really cool actually because a lot of recipes they they give you uh like you look up like we're in the age of like you can look up a recipe online that's right. like, like like you need 150 grams of sugar it's like, i'm not going to sit there and measure 150 grams of sugar i'm just going to take a like, handful of sugar and throw yeah. in whatever i want right yeah and so yeah something like that would help you be a lot more precise in terms of in terms of that stuff mm -hmm. thank you yep mm -hmm. all right zoom people any any final questions Okay, all right, so I'll see you guys on Thursday.